Welcome to IDF TV. My name is Frank Impius and I'm from the Oracle JDevelopment and IDF product management team. In this session we talk about application security and it's the first out of four recordings on this topic. So what is security? The definition I found on Wikipedia says that security is a degree of protection, not a cure. Just a degree of protection against danger, damage, loss and crime, which is a categorization that we can easily apply to application development as well. So let's play a game. If you want to protect your application, um, because the application becomes an attack surface, so if you want to protect it and you have budget, would you buy a firewall? So let's think about what a firewall is doing. A firewall protects external access to a server, protecting the inner infrastructure from external attacks or whatever. However, for your application to work, at least one channel, one protocol needs to be opened, and that's typically is HTTP, because otherwise your firewall will protect access to the application and nobody will be able to use it externally. So with this HTTP channel open, people work within your application, but however, your application now becomes a proxy to the internal infrastructure. So that means that if your application is not secure, if it's not safe by default or by design, then what could happen is that people seek and then misuse your application to hack into the database to delete data, manipulate data or whatever they can do with the permission that the application has. So obviously a firewall, though it's important for protecting the perimeter, so the infrastructure in general, as soon as someone is in your application, working with your application, there needs to be more protection assigned to it. So yes, buy a firewall but don't close the shopping list after that. So how do we get more guidance on what we really need to think about and to care about when we build applications? There is an organization called the Open Web Application Security Project or just in short OWASP and I recommend you going to the website just search for OWASP and you will get there and they provide a wealth of documentation and tooling to harden application development to make it more safe and more secure. You might even decide to join them for the local chapters on the global level to contribute to their work. However, this group has a wealth of experience and a security knowledge. And what they do is they, once in a year, typically, they document and publish that document about a top 10 list of vulnerabilities. Now, this top 10 list doesn't mean that there are only 10 items to look for, Probably there are hundreds of items, but it's a good start and a lot of customers are aware of that and they ask, hey Oracle, how do you address this with an Oracle ADF? So let's have a look at some of the top 10 listing here and I'm not quite sure from which year I picked the top 10 bullets I'm presenting here, but there are typical suspects that always show up and I'm pretty sure that 8 out of 10 would show on every list. So let's start with SQL injection. What is SQL injection? Well, you might meet the requirement where you need maximum flexibility for users to define a query, to filter a query. And for that reason, you allow them, if they're you know, um, knowledgeable enough, to put in SQL queries, where clauses directly, to type this in just to provide them the maximum flexibility they want. Well, someone who knows that you're just not filtering the uh, where clause will be able now to type in something to the field and in the end will destroy data, manipulate data. Now, to avoid this, you want to filter whatever comes from an input field and you want to validate that. But again, the options you have, if you allow free text entry, it would be a blacklist or a whitelist. It's not perfect. It's a good start, but it's not perfect. The perfect way here would be to use bind variables, not to allow free text field entry of SQL strings. But still, we see this as a requirement and developers might be in line to implement it that way that the user can type in a SQL string and they just pass it along. Maybe even create a view object dynamically based on this SQL query. The second uh, topic to talk about is cross-site scripting. Typical use case here is a forum case where someone provides an answer or maybe a Facebook page. You just allow people to comment on an article of yours and this someone is putting in JavaScript. If this is not encoded, then the JavaScript will, with the next refresh of the page being executed on the page, may access cookies, steal cookies, or manipulate the content. 
So here JavaScript input and general every input needs to be encoded. Idea Faces is doing that, however, you need to be aware if the framework that you use is doing it or not. The next topic is authentication and session management. Typically, when we look at security that is used in Java EE, the container takes care of authentication and session management. Some users don't want that. They want to be in control of how the session is managed and how the user is authenticated. So they build in their own mechanisms for that. And they're pretty proud of it. Well, the risk here is that if the mechanism that you use is predictable, like a token that you append to a request or a hidden field, then anyone else could predict this and just play around with the application and finally they're in or stealing a session. So you need to be aware of this if you're doing that. If you just go with the Java e container managed security, then of course you rely or you trust what the container is doing, which typically is a safe bet to do. The next topic then is the insecure direct object reference. Now, the scenario here would be where your ADF application will generate reports as Excel sheets or PDF documents, and then you redirect the user to that documents. If the documents have predictable naming patterns, then you could start guessing other people's documents. If you know that a document starts with a sequential number and then the authenticated username, dot .pdf, you can just playing around trying to find somebody else's documents. And if this pattern is so predictable, you definitely will find some. If that document then is not protected, that is verified, if the user is allowed to access the document, you're in trouble. Cross-site request forgery is kind of the similar thing to the session management, where you just have a token which is not protected or not secure enough, and people can just use a playback of an old request to get into an existing session, to reopen the session or to get the information. This is typically what people use for phishing attacks. The next is security misconfiguration. Well, security in many frameworks can be enabled and disabled by just configuring the, uh, the enforcement of the policies. At development, you build in security and you test it at development with security enabled. And then you have the QA stage and the QA people might hit a problem. And while they're hitting the problem, they're switching off security to see if that is a security related problem or if that is a problem in the application. Now, if they kind of eventually are happy with the application, they might move and pass it on to production and then security is disabled. If on the production side, nobody looks at kind of a laundry list for security settings, they would just broadcast the application, bring it live the way it is, and then it's not secured. Another example would be if you work with authentication providers with lock-in modules. You can chain up lock-in modules that if the user authentication passes these lock-in modules will add privileges for a specific user. However, what could also happen is that someone sets the flag for a required lock-in module to optional, which now the required um, module can fail and still users will be authenticated and allowed to get into the application. So security misconfiguration definitely is a problem. The next uh, topic is insecure cryptographic storage. Take the example of a web application that needs to call out to a web service and this web service requires authentication and you want to dynamically pass this authentication as username and password pair. So while the user logs in, you intercept the user password and you keep it in the session. If you don't have it un uh, encrypted there and if the encryption is not strong enough, Everyone who could hijack the session or just get access to the request could steal the password and then they would be able to run maybe even the whole application on your behalf. So whatever you need to store, which is sensitive, especially think about the mobile case, if on the mobile side you want to, on the client side, store a password for users so that you have the um, this kind of one-click start and still have authentication enforced, if that storage is not encrypted and if it's not well encrypted, you put the whole system at risk and the application becomes an even bigger attack surface. The next is a failure of direct URL requests. So every web document is referenced by URL. And if you look at Java server faces, Java server faces in the faces config file, for instance, defines navigation cases. And these navigation cases go from one view to the next view. 
And each of the views can be directly accessed and requested from a URL. So if you want me to start with your main page, but I know the URL of a second page, I can go straight there. And if you're not having security in place to prevent me doing this, then I can do whatever I want. And I might be lucky that I can bypass authentication because if you're not enforcing security on the second page, only on the main page, as you assume that everyone will get into the main page, you're in trouble again. There are mechanisms in IDF, and we talk about this in one of the next recordings, that prevents all of this. So if you're an IDF user, sit back, relax a bit, because more or less out of the box, you're protected against this. The next then is, which typically shows on that list, would be transport layer security. Now, if a message can be changed in transition, then the message is worth nothing. Typically, that's a web service case or a web service problem, but could also apply to the matches, messages you sent with the web application. Best example would be a locking page. Typically, you would run to run this on HTTPS just to ensure that the message layer is protected and now we can sniff the password out of that. And then the, the last topic to talk about on, the, on this list this is then insecure redirects. It's similar to not be able to protect a direct URL request, but you might even have experiences in your own development. Um, assume that you have two Java E applications and this Java E application running their own Java E context, which means they're not sharing a session. However, for some reason, what you want to do is you want to make them appear to the user at one. So if Java E application one calls out to Java E application two, then if two returns to Java E application one, you want to reset, rebuild the context that you lost because you lost the session. So you pass back some parameter, some token that the other application would use to reestablish trust and context. Especially the trust thing is a risky point here. So if you implemented something like that, just quickly go to your server and see if you protected that, if you have a strong encryption on the token or whatever you use, and if this can be replayed yeah? if you have some sort of mechanism that protects incoming requests or actually makes incoming requests being checked if they are allowed from where they're coming from. So maybe putting some expiry time on a token that would be returned from the request. So these are just 10 examples out of so many examples that I could give and I guess that the um, Open Web Application Security Team also could to give to you uh, to protect your application. So what is the best thing to do uh, to protect against all of these and all of the things you might read up on the website? Simple um, solution, education, awareness, good coding guidelines. And this is where you want to spend your budget. So make sure that you educate people on security. You don't have to have everyone educated, honestly, on everything in ADF. Same for PSQL integration that I talked last time about. Security is something that you need to have people be aware of, but you need to have a few people that really have the security head off and they come up with secure coding guidelines, including like what do you want your application to do if things go wrong? Just you know, pass on all the information that are requested or just lock down the user. And I tell you, sometimes it's better to annoy a user than to lose data. So some sort of guidelines that you want to set up based on experience, security, knowledge. And of course, what you need to do for that is you need to understand design pattern, design principles, and technology. And technology could be bought, kind of single salon service or authentication providers and uh, containers, but also could be tooling. Now, the tools that you find in Oracle IDF for implementing security are not only ADF security. So ADF security should not be your only check mark on your list of protection when you build ADF applications. There are so many more and we will cover all of these. So in the next recording we will talk about design patterns, we will talk about design principles for secure application development, just giving you more heads up. In the third recording we talk about ADF security to look at what ADF security can do for you and the fourth recording will then give you a list of practices and other tools, including mechanisms on the bounded task level, on the ADFBC level, on the Java surfaces front, that 
all can help building secure applications on your side. But however, you need to have the awareness, you need to be aware of the attack surface, and you need to have the education for it.